There we go. That's working. All right. Hello, Brazil JS. There are an awful lot of you. <laughs> You'll excuse me as I conquer my fear with a gigantic panorama photo of you all. <laughs> Excellent. All right, is everybody having a good time? <laughs> so, I'm Laurie Voss. I'm CTO of NPM Inc. Uh, and you probably haven't heard of me. In fact, very few people at this conference have any idea who I am because I am not the famous NPM person. The famous NPM person is Isaac, who invented NPM. I am the other guy. Uh, when Isaac founded NPM Inc. 20 months ago, I am the dude that he picked to run his engineering team because Isaac knows how to build NPM, but he didn't know how to run a startup, and that was what he wanted me for. What am I going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking about NPM. Briefly, how NPM became the way it is, a look at the current NPM features that we think you'll find useful, and a look ahead to where we're taking NPM in future. Uh, I was told at BrazilJS that we don't take questions at the end, uh, and I really like questions, so I sort of hijacked the process, and I went to Twitter, uh, and I took questions before the talk started, uh, so I'll be putting answers to some of your questions in amongst my slides today. Also, as a warning, as you've already picked up, I'm a very fast talker, uh, and I cannot hear the translator screaming in agony trying to keep up with me. So. If I start going too fast, uh, just put your hands up in the air and be like, hold up, hold up, wait for the translator. Uh, and I'll know to slow down or repeat myself or something. So first, the past. Uh, the key thing to understanding NPM is remembering the problem that it was built to solve. And the problem that it was, that explains a lot of how it works now and points to where we should be taking it. Uh, and the problem that NPM solves is distribution of code. And the way that it solves that problem is by reducing friction at every point in that process of distributing code. There are three parts to the distribution of code. Uh, there's finding the code, there's downloading the code, and there's installing the code. And NPM tackles all three of those things. Uh, and let's talk about the first one, the last one first, which is installing, because that was the one that NPM solved first. Uh, in the early days of Node, uh, people started sharing code via Git repos, and they had you know, huge banks of instructions like this, which you don't need to be able to read. The point of them is that they're very confusing. Uh, getting dependencies installed was painful. Updating them was painful. It was a pretty familiar problem. Node realized that it needed a package manager, uh, and the other languages had, the, had one. It was not like an amazing new idea that we should build a package manager. Uh, so yet another package manager. So what? Well, NPM was different from the other package managers. Uh, in a couple of ways. Uh, the first was that it eliminated dependency hell. Uh, and the second was that it promoted in a really big way, in a really fundamental way, semantic versioning. Uh, that second feature is really common now, but at the time when NPM was invented, it was, pretty, it was a, a pretty new idea. Uh, and the first feature, the, the eliminating dependency hell, uh, that still remains pretty unique. Uh, so what do I mean when I say that NPM prevents dependency hell. Most people have heard, you know, dependency hell is this term thrown around. What do I mean? Why is it, why was it a big deal? Uh, imagine that you have three modules, A, B, and C. Uh, a requires B at version one, and C requires B but at version two. Uh, and I create an app, and it requires both A and C. My package manager needs to provide a version of B. In all other runtimes prior to Node.js and NPM, this is what the package manager do, would do. An infinite loop of pain and frustration would result. There was no way to fix it. It would just go crazy. Uh, and instead, NPM does this. It puts both versions of B into the tree under the module that needs them. Uh, but that by itself isn't enough. Node itself has to do some of this work. Inside Node, the module loader, the thing that puts these modules into memory, it has to know what to do. It has to know when it sees two versions of B what it should be doing with that. And it does. It knows exactly what to do. It loads both into memory at the same time, and they don't conflict. How is it that it does that? How is it that the node module loader knew to do that? How is it that NPM could take advantage of this feature? Uh, it's because they were originally written by the same person. Uh, this is part of what makes NPM such a uniquely great package manager, 
was that it and Node evolved at the same time. The other package managers, they were written long after the language that they serve was invented, but Node and NPM were created at the same time. I'm going slightly too fast. So, Node's module loader was written to work well with NPM, and NPM was written to work well with the module loader. And Node.js is, as a result, the only time where it's the only runtime where avoiding dependency hell is even possible. And NPM is how it does that. A is that better in some way? OK. A quick note about, whoa, that's really loud. <laughs> a quick note about vocabulary. I keep calling Node.js a runtime. I do that to distinguish it from a language. JavaScript is the language. In JavaScript, dependency hell is possible, and in browsers, in fact, it's extremely possible. So avoiding dependency hell is a thing that you can do, but it's a thing that you can only do in Node. Uh, and that's going to become important because people have started doing front-end things with NPM. Uh, so now my first question from the audience yesterday. Uh, Nando wanted to know why every package has its own Node modules folder instead of a single global folder like RubyGems does. Uh, there are many pieces to that answer. Some of them are historical, stuff like that. Um, but one of the biggest reasons is that doing it this way makes avoiding dependency hell a lot easier. If we installed every single module into a global NPM folder like, like RubyGems does, then we wouldn't be able to install multiple versions of the same package. They'd collide with each other. Uh, we could do it by saving every version of every package and changing the module loader so that it knew that you know, there was you know, version 1, version 2, version 3 in this directory, and you can find that there. But why bother doing that? Creating your own node modules folder for every single installation works really well. It makes it really easy to see what modules you're using. It makes it really easy to package stuff up. Uh, and really, the only thing that it wastes is disk space. But it turns out that modules aren't very big. And disk space is really cheap. So uh, this is probably the easiest way to do it. So back to NPM and the other thing that makes NPM unique, which is its approach to semantic versioning or SEMVR. Uh, I was wondering how somebody would translate SEMVR. It's just SEMVR. I don't think it needs a translation. So now is not the time to go into a full tutorial about how SEMVR works, because nobody really understands how SEMVR works anyway. Um, but the basic idea is that the version numbers have three main components. The first is the major version. If you increment, you increment it when you make a version that's incompatible with the previous version. The second is the minor version. You increment it when you add functionality, uh, but existing functionality works the same. And the third is the patch version, which is when you, incre you increment that one when you make bug fixes that don't add functionality uh, or break anything. Semantic versioning is really simple, but it's extremely powerful because it means that you can tell without needing to read the documentation, without needing to read anything other than the name of the package, uh, how much risk you're taking on by updating your code to that new version. You know that the patch version is fine. Just bring in all of the patch versions. And the minor versions, that might be cool, but it's not, you know, it's not dangerous. And you know that the big version is like, whoa, OK, we're going to you know, spend a couple of weeks making sure that everything still works. Uh, that sort of basic software contract, that fact that you can know that, without needing to have like a meeting with the person who, ran, who, who runs the project, means that you can use lots and lots of modules. It means that uh, you can use the, sort of the node pattern of many, many small modules that do little things perfectly. That's enabled by SEMVR. In fact, it's sort of why node modules, nodes, Node works that way. The reason that Node has the small modules pattern is because NPM makes the small modules pattern practical. It makes it possible to have thousands of dependencies without having to like, have this huge mental overhead of what these thousands of dependencies are doing at any one time. You just know that Node's gonna, uh, that NPM's going to get them right. So now we've covered how NPM reduces friction when installing and updating modules. But installing stuff is more than just putting the bits into the right place. You have to get the bits from somewhere. Uh, and that is step two, that is downloading. When NPM downloads your packages, where do those downloads come from? They come from the registry, and the NPM registry is a really big part of NPM. It is very, very popular these days. We get nearly 2 billion downloads every, in fact, over 2 billion downloads every month. Uh, to our surprise, a lot of people, a lot of new users of NPM, 
don't know that there is a registry. If you've been using Node for more than about two years, you're very aware that there's a registry because it used to be down all the time. And you used to be really frustrated with it being down all the time. But now the registry is up nearly all of the time. And so it's sort of invisible. New users of NPM, they don't know that there's a registry. They just think it sort of comes out of the air or it comes from GitHub or something. Uh, so why do we have a registry? There are other package managers in JavaScript like Bower and JSPM. Uh, and they use GitHub. They pull stuff directly down out of, off of GitHub. So why would we bother? Why would we host them ourselves? Uh, we think there is a, an important distinction between GitHub or you know, any Git server and the registry. Uh, we think that Git is for working on your source code. It's for you know, collaborating on individual lines and diffs and things like that. And NPM is for distributing the final project. That means that you include some things and you exclude some other things. So what would you put on NPM that you wouldn't check into GitHub? Well, usually the stuff that makes for really bad diffs. If you have compiled code, or you have minified or transpiled code, or you have really big binary assets that are part of your package, you're never going to check those into Git. It's really annoying to have them in Git, but you would put them into your NPM package. And then there's a bunch of stuff that you would put on GitHub that you wouldn't put into NPM. Uh, for instance, if you clone a Git repo, you get you, know, you clone master, you get every single version of that package that has ever existed. That's just how Git works, uh, which means that if that package has a really long history or you know, somebody checked in something big once upon a time, that, that cloning that repo can be really, really slow, even if the, registry, even if the uh, package itself is small. Uh, and you can also exclude other dev stuff. You can exclude the docs and the tests and stuff like that. You don't need them when they're you know, installed as a dependency. Uh, which means that the packages on the registry, they're smaller and they're faster to download, partly because they're just you know, one little tarball rather than a ton of little requests in order to uh, get stuff from Git. So now we continue to travel upwards to the first part of distribution, which is discovery. And that is npmjs.com. npmjs.com is where we collect all of the packages together and let you search for them. Uh, People use it millions and millions of times every month, and now the registry has over 176,000 packages in it. Uh, and it's kind of beginning to sort of show that that's, that's a lot of packages, and it's hard to find stuff in there. And it's one of the big challenges of NPM right now. It's like, and when there's 176,000 packages, which is the good one? So putting that all together, there's friction at every single step. There's scattered project, there's Git repos, there's dependency hell. And NPM is there at every step reducing friction, just getting out of your way, trying to make this whole thing easier. That's what NPM is always trying to do. Uh, and it's doing it to the tune of about 6 billion installs every month. There's 2 billion downloads, but most, download, most installs are actually from your local cache. So there's 6 billion installs happening every month. And we think there's somewhere between 2 and 3 million node developers doing it. So now we know the problem that NPM was built to solve. Let's talk about how you can use NPM, inc including some of the less commonly used features of NPM that we wish uh, more people took advantage of. Uh, but before we get to that, what are people actually using this node stuff to build? Uh, sitting where we are with the registry downloads data, we can get a pretty good picture of what's going on. Uh, there are a lot of command line tools being done. Uh, NPM is used to write NPM itself, so it makes NPM really very good at writing command line tools because that's what it's for. Uh, and as a result, there's also a bunch of tools in the registry that make writing command line interfaces easier. Uh, one of them is YARGS, which is maintained now by my colleague Ben Coe, uh, and he recently added internationalization support to it. Uh, and as of this week, I can announce that one of the supported, one of the supported languages is Portuguese. Uh, so if you want to rent, write a command line interface and it works in Portuguese, YARGS is your place to go. Uh, People also write a whole bunch of web service APIs, especially proxies. There's a huge chunk of node that is just sitting in between two other older services and being the proxy and converting data from one form to the other. That's a huge use case for node. Uh, people obviously also write web apps. And increasingly, they, run fr they write front-end JavaScript components. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit. Uh, they also write frameworks, lots and lots and lots of frameworks, so many frameworks. I'm not sure why we need quite so many frameworks. Uh, they also write lots of plugins for those frameworks. And there are also a ton of great tools for doing browser automation and testing. So how do people do all this stuff? Well, there's an awful lot of NPM installing going on, like I said. 
but there's a lot more to npm than install. So let's start at the very beginning, which is npm ping. This is a really silly and simple command, and it does exactly two things. Uh, it tells you which registry you're pointing at, uh, and it tells you whether that registry is up or down. Uh, that sounds like a really trivial thing, and it is, but an enormous number of our support requests at NPM are resolved by getting people to run NPM ping and then discover that they're accidentally pointing at some mirror in, you know, you know Eastern Europe somewhere, or, uh, you, know, they for, you know, their network connection is down or something. Uh, and it used to be quite tricky to verify that for people, so we love NPM ping. Uh, and the other thing that NPM support team really loves is NPM who am I? Uh, this one checks if you're logged in and who you're logged in as. An enormous number of our publishing problems are people who are, think they're logged in as one person or actually logged in as somebody else or not logged in at all. Next up is npm init. Uh, a lot of new users of Node don't know about npm init. Uh, npm init helps you start your new package by writing your package JSON file for you. It asks you a bunch of questions in a little interview, uh, like the name or the description or your test commands, uh, wow, that is super readable. Uh, and it also does a bunch of smart guessing. It assumes the name of the folder you're in is the name of your package. Uh, if the folder that you're in is a Git repo, it will set that as the repository field for your package JSON. Uh, and if you've already got a node modules folder in there, it will set all of the, all of the packages in your node modules folder as your dependencies. Uh, you can also run it again if you want to add extra fields to your package JSON later. It doesn't delete stuff. It doesn't you know, mess up your package JSON if you have stuff in there. So it's super useful. Uh, but even people who know about NPM init don't know that there has one extra big hidden feature, uh, which is that this, this interview that it goes through, these questions that it asks, they're customizable. Uh, you can create a .npm init.js file uh, and put it in your home directory. And you can get it to ask whatever questions you want. And you can get it to write whatever package JSON you want it to write uh, and set defaults for the things inside of your company that you always have. Like if you always test a certain way or you always have a setup a certain way or you always want to use the database in a certain way, you can just make your package JSON be automatically the right way for your company, uh, which can be super convenient. Uh, the package that is doing this is called Promzard. Uh, you create a file that defines an object that looks like package JSON. Uh, and it turns it into a package JSON. It's a very simple thing. It gives you a nifty function called prompt, which uh, makes it easy to ask the user questions, and you can supply a default value. Uh, value. In this case, uh, it's always going to name your package Bob, which is obviously a super useful thing if you work at you know, Bobco. Uh, and you can set every single field in package JSON this way, the scripts, the tests, the repositories, whatever the hell it is you want to do. Uh, and you just give everybody at your company this file, and suddenly, all of your packages have this perfect adherence to your company's naming specifications and your best practices about testing and stuff like that uh, without ha them having to you know, manually type that stuff in or copying and pasting from a wiki or you know, something that's a pain in the ass like that. Uh, while we're on init, I should also mention the save and save depths options to install. These ones are super basic, but not enough people use them. Uh, basically, if you install with dash dash save, it will update your package JSON dependencies for you. Uh, and it will also update your shrink wrap file, uh, which brings us to shrink wrap, which is uh, a controversial topic sometimes. Uh, like I said at the beginning, semantic versioning, it's core to the way NPM works. It's core to what we do. Uh, and it's great because it lets you, you know, automatically and safely pull in patches and minor features without getting breaking changes. However, sometimes, you know, Semver is, is a human process. It's run by humans, and sometimes they make mistakes. Sometimes somebody releases a patch version that's not really a patch version. It actually does have a breaking change in it. Uh, and that can be very upsetting in production. If you deploy to production and you, know, you pull in a patch change and your whole app breaks, suddenly you're very annoyed at NPM. Uh, and you don't want there to be even a chance of that happening. Uh, you want what you're running in dev to be exactly down to the byte what you're running in, in uh, prod. And that is what running npm shrink wrap will do. Uh, it looks at your dependencies and all of their dependencies and all of their dependencies all the way down the tree, uh, and it writes an npm shrink wrap JSON file uh, to your package directory. Uh, now, if you check that code out anywhere and you run npm install, it will install exactly the same packages that you had before, right down to the byte, uh, and it will be exactly the same. One snag with shrink wrap historically has been that in npm 2, uh, you would need to rerun shrink wrap manually every time you wanted to publish. 
uh, in NPM3, we fixed that. And if you're using save and save depths, uh, then your shrink wrap will automatically update to include the new packages, which eliminates a whole class of things that people thought were bugs but weren't really bugs. It was just, you know, being kind of frictionful. Uh, I'm going to talk more about NPM3 in a bit. Uh, but now we get to another question. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher this name, John Carlo. I don't know. Uh, he wanted to know why is shrink wrap an extra step? If shrink wrap is so useful, uh, why doesn't NPM just lock everything to a version by the def default like Bundler does? This is a very common question, especially pe to, uh, from people who are coming to the node world from Rubyland, which is uh, where Bundler lives. Uh, and the answer is Semver. We like Semver. We th think automatically picking up bug fixes is a really great idea in development. Uh, and if you want to avoid surprises in production, then Shrinkwrap is there for you. Following Semver does more good than it does harm. We think as a default, it's a sensible thing to do. And making it the default costs you nothing. Uh, so why not do it? Uh, but talking about shrink wrap brings up another question we get asked a lot, uh, which is whether you can use shrink wrap to create a package you can install offline. And that just comes from the name. People are like shrink wrap. It makes it feel like a package that I can just you know take somewhere and do something with. Um, you know, so that you can install something offline or you can install something when you have a bad internet connection. Bad internet connections have been kind of a topic of discussion for the last couple of days. Uh, the answer is that you can do this, but you, can't, you don't do it with shrink wrap. The command that you want is npm pack. npm pack will create a tarball out of any package, uh, whether it's on your hard drive or it's on the registry. Uh, and then you can use npm install to install that, pack, that tarball directly. Uh, which is, a lot of th which is a thing that a lot of people don't know about npm install. You can just give it a tarball and go. Uh, of course, if you use npm pack and your app has dependencies, it would still need to hit the registry to get those dependencies. Uh, but you can get around this if it's your package uh, by declaring your dependencies as bundle dependencies. Then npm pack and npm will take all of your dependencies and cram them all into your uh, tarball file. Uh, and this is how npm installs itself. npm doesn't rely on the registry to install all of npm. It just has a single giant tarball that installs all of NPM in one go. Uh, which brings us to a related question from Raphael, uh, who also wanted to know about shrink wrap, uh, which is how does this dependency cache work? Uh, this is a really great question because a lot of people are very confused about it. People think NPM downloads every single package every time, uh, which it definitely does not do. Whenever NPM downloads a package, it puts it into a cache in your home directory. Uh, if you ever try to install the same version of the same package twice, it's not downloading it again. It's in installing it from the cache. It will just use the local copy. However, it still hits the network because it has to ask the registry, is this the right version of this package? Is there a newer version of this package that you know satisfies Semver that would be better than the one that I already have in my cache? Uh, of course, if you just disabled that check and everything was already in cache, then you could install offline, right? You could, you know. You could install everything you wanted without having to hit the registry at all. And in fact, there is already a grievous hack that exists that can do that. It's this one. You just in npm install, and you tell it to use stuff that is in the cache, even if it's really, really stale. Uh, we should probably like bless this feature, because right? enough people want it. We should probably just you know, call this npm dash dash offline. Uh, and that's probably something we're going to do. So back to those npm commands. NPM version is another command people don't use enough. If you're tired of manually editing your package JSON file, uh, you can get NPM to do it for you. NPM version uh, will automatically increment your package JSON for, for you. And if your package is in a Git repository, uh, it will also create a commit to your Git repository that says this, is, this, ki this commit is this tag is this version, uh, which is very useful for automated build systems and stuff like that. Uh, it will also take care of trickier versioning cases like pre-minor releases and stuff like that where you forget what the syntax is anyway and you're just like, yeah, this is a pre-something, go. Uh, speaking of automated build systems, a ton of people these, use, these days are using automated build systems like in automated uh, continuous integration systems, CI. Uh, but they run into a problem with CI systems, which is that they'll often use a specific version of Node that is not the same as the version that you want to use uh, and they won't let you upgrade it. Uh, Nodebin is a package that is, can help you get around that restriction. Uh, it was written by my colleague, Arya Stewart. 
Uh, and if you can't upgrade Node or NPM locally or on your CI host, Nodebin will install that version of Node directly into your Node modules folder, and it will let you use the right version of Node right from there. Another thing that people are using NPM to help with is transpilation. Transpilation is the new sort of step zero in everyone's development cycle. Everyone wants to use ES 2015 features. Uh, and, you know, Babel is the thing will help you out, uh, and more on that later. But both Nodebin and Babel are third-party modules that reveal another big part of using NPM effectively, which is NPM run scripts. Uh, there are four special run scripts that you may have already encountered. There's NPM test, NPM start, NPM restart, and NPM stop. You define these scripts in your package JSON like this, uh, and it makes it e easy for other devs to start your package and test your code, which is all pretty simple, nothing very exciting there. Uh, but beyond those four scripts, there's the npm run command, which will let you run any script you define. This can be extremely helpful when you're working in a large team and you have shared tasks that you want to run frequently. Uh, you don't have to have a readme file that has a bunch of manual steps that says, you know, do this and then that and then that and then that. You can just build a run script that says npm run setup, and it will do all of that stuff for you. At its most basic, this is useful because it saves a bunch of typing. NPM is always about reducing friction, and repetitive typing is obviously friction. Uh, this example is the code formatter that we use on our internal APIs. Uh, but there's more to run scripts than just reducing the amount of typing you're doing. One of the potential problems with a run script is that you might want to use a tool like Grunt or Gulp that's usually installed as a global utility, but you can't guarantee that people will have installed it there. So you end up in this situation where you're like, your readme says, oh, you install the package, and then you install Grunt, and then you install Gulp, and then you install something else, and it's a pain in the ass. So how can you be sure that it's there? The answer is that you can put any tools like that into your dev dependencies. NPM run scripts automatically run with your node modules folder in the path, so any tool that is present in your dev dependencies is available to your run scripts, even if it's not globally installed. So you don't have to worry whether or not your users have installed Grunt or Gulp, as long as you've declared it as a dev dependency, it will be available to your run scripts. Scripts that are run by NPM in this way, they also have a bunch of other useful features. If your package JSON has a config stanza, uh, then the keys in there become environment variables available to your script. Uh, other parts of your package JSON, like the name or the version, stuff like that, that's available to the scripts as well. But once you've got the hang of run scripts, you can make them even more useful by using lifecycle events which is another set of special scripts that NPM looks for when it's doing certain tasks. Pre-publish is a particularly useful one. If you want to make sure that you never publish your package if the tests fail, or if the code isn't formatted, or whatever you know, sort of quality, uh, quality restraint you want to put on your team and say, never publish a package that doesn't match this, you can set a pre-publish script that runs, and if the script fails, the publish will abort. It will make it literally impossible to publish a bad version of your package. Uh, of course, sometimes you want the same script to run at different times, and NPM supports that too. Your run scripts can call other NPM run scripts. So your pre-published scripts can call other stages, and your start and your test scripts can call the same common steps that they have together without you needing to repeat yourself. Here's a quick example of a pre-published script. You can test, and then you build your CSS, and then you format. Uh, note that I'm using the double and, the and and there. It works on all platforms, including Windows, but semicolons are Unix only. So for compatibility, if you want your package to work everywhere, use the and and. There is one little caveat about pre-publish, which is that if you are in the root of a package and you run npm install with no other arguments, the pre-published stuff will run then as well. Uh, some people find that very surprising. The idea is that if you're using pre-publish to compile, like CoffeeScript or Babeldoo, uh, and you've checked out the code from GitHub, then you want the pre-published step to run because you want it to look like you've just installed that package. But if you have stuff that you don't want to run on install, uh, then we recommend you use the pre-version event instead. You can set a pre-version script, which calls your post-version script, and you can chain them together. Uh, and chaining run scripts together can be an incredibly powerful way to automate your build process and automate your development cycle for a lot of your developers. So when is it a good idea to use these lifecycle events? Well, there's all sorts of stuff. Compiling, like I said, is a really great case. Babel is, a, is one of the big users of the lifecycle events. 
so is bundling and minifying your CSS and running Browserify. Uh, you can also use it to make sure your tests always run uh, or to clean up your code or to run a static analysis to make sure there are no security holes, whatever you want. Uh, Seth Vincent gave a really awesome talk uh, called CSS via NPM, which was about making CSS modular by publishing it to NPM. So you could just NPM install bits of you know, UI for your website. Uh, and his method uses run scripts to do it. Uh, we think using NPM to handle sharing front-end web code and CSS like this is a really good idea, even if it's not JavaScript. Uh, I'm going to talk more a little, a little bit more about that at the end. Another really amazing tool that uh, makes great use of lifecycle events is the semantic release package by Stefan Bonneman. Uh, if you use meaningful commit messages, commit messages that say this was a patch or this was a change or this was a new feature, uh, then it will automatically update your version according, uh, accordingly. And it will even write a nice change log file for you and keep it up to date for you so you don't have to do any of that stuff, which is all very nice. But it has a really magical feature, which is that if you make a release, it will run the tests from the previous release of your package. And if the tests from the previous release fa of your package fail, it will declare that you have made a breaking change and it will prevent you from publishing your package. It will automatically detect a breaking change and make it impossible for you to publish a breaking change unless you've explicitly declared that I meant to make a breaking change in this case. Uh, in fact, by default, it requires you to have written instructions on how to upgrade through the bro breaking change, which is a really brilliant little piece of code discipline. Uh, and the way that it works is it uses NPM pre-publish and post-publish hooks to do it. Uh, the next NPM feature that I want to mention is the team management stuff, which was released exactly two days ago. The registry features that support them are currently in a limited beta, uh, but they are coming very soon to everyone, uh, which is good news because people have been asking to be able to do this kind of stuff for a very long time. So what are teams? At the moment, you have NPM owners. Uh, that's a command that lets you give other people access to your packages. Uh, but it's pretty basic. It's, it's not very granular. Uh, anybody who is in your owners can automatically publish your package, which is you know, often more power than you really intended to give them. Uh, and if you have more than one package that you want to give people access to, you have to give them individuals access to each package over and over and over. And if you're working at a big company with a lot of people on your team, that gets really tedious really fast. Uh, so teams are the obvious solution. You create a team, you add users to that team, you give the team access to packages, uh, and the access can be read-only or read-write. And that flag is per package and per team. Uh, so here's a simple example. Imagine I have three teams. I have my web team, I have my API team, and I have my QA team. The QA team can't publish any packages at all. They can only install them. Maybe they're an outsourced team. Uh, the web and the API teams can publish their own work, but they can only install the other team's works. Uh, and they share a core package. To manage teams, you need to create an NPM organization to put them into. Organizations and teams are two of the new paid features of the registry, so I promise I won't spend too much time plugging them. Uh, but you are literally the first audience in the world to hear that these features exist, so it's kind of a big deal. Every org comes with its own scope, just like users do right now. So in addition to being able to publish under your username, you can also publish your, under your org's username now, uh, and you can share that org username with everybody you work with. Again, pretty basic feature, but it's been one missing from NPM since the very beginning. Once you have an org with a scope, you can create a team. Uh, NPM team create my company web. My company is the name of your scope. Web is the name of your team. There's nothing special about either of these names. They're just examples. Uh, and obviously, you can use destroy to delete the team if you don't want it anymore. Once you've got teams, you need to put users in them. NPM team add, the team, and then the username. And removing them is the same command, just with rm instead of add. Uh, you can list all of the users in the team. It's just ls and the team name. Uh, and if you want to list all of the teams in the org, uh, just ls with the org name by itself. So now you've got some users in teams. You have to say what packages they have access to. Say I want to give read-only access to the packages to my web team. NPM access grant will do that. Uh, I can make it read-only, I can make it read-write, and I can take the permission away again with revoke. If you want to know who's got access to a particular package, NPM access LS collaborators will do that. What about the other way around? You want to know what packages somebody has access to? NPM access LS packages will do that. 
uh, you can add, you can see what packages a team has access to, or a whole org has access to, or just an individual user. If this just sounds like a sales pitch, I apologize. But if this is exciting to you, you can sign up for the org's beta at that link. So that's it for the current NPM commands. Uh, we just learned a pile of, of NPM commands. There's ping, who am I, init, shrink, wrap, pack, version, run. Uh, chief among them, I think, is the powerhouse that is run scripts. It's a really an amazing and powerful framework built into NPM that are not, not enough people are taking advantage of. Uh, and I hope everybody learned at least one command they hadn't heard of before. So now we come to the final part, which is where is NPM going? Uh, and the simplest and most obvious answer to that question is that NPM is going to version 3. Uh, NPM 3 is in beta right now. You can install it today. Uh, well, not right now, because there's no Wi-Fi. Uh, a full recap of NPM 3 is a whole talk, uh, but there are some highlights. Oh my god, we finally have a progress bar. It only took us four years to build. <laughs> Requests for a progress bar are literally as old as NPM. A progress bar came in as a request on the second day, uh, and we only just got it done. Uh, and people really hated the spinner, like, oh, wow, did we get some hate mail about the spinner. Uh, but it actually required rewriting a huge chunk of NPM to get that done, because the thing that made a uh, progress bar difficult uh, was part of a much bigger problem with NPM, which is that NPM was non-deterministic. Uh, NPM 1 had a very naive installer that just looked at all of your package JSON dependencies, and it tried to install everything at the same time. Um, this created a ton of race conditions, but uh, NPM 1 had the saving grace of it was also really, really slow, so the race conditions hardly ever happened because it was just going too slowly. Uh, so when we started NPM Inc. and we released NPM 2, we made NPM a lot faster. Uh, but that meant that the race conditions started happening all the time. So people kept running into these things. And it looked like NPM2 was suddenly less reliable, even though it was just NPM1, but faster. Uh, so we had to get rid of the race conditions. Uh, and the way that we did that is that NPM3 calculates your full, what your full install tree is going to be in advance before it does anything. Uh, and as a side, of a side effect of that, we know for the first time how much stuff we have to do before we start doing it, which means that we can give you that progress bar. Uh, but the even bigger change that happens as a result of us doing that calculation is that NPM3 now dedupes by default. This diagram is showing what I mean. Uh, NPM2 installs all of your dependencies multiple times. It just installs every dependency of every package all the way down. Uh, but NPM3 just installs the minimum necessary. Uh, it still duplicates when necessary to avoid conflicts. You can see A and B from our earlier example are still there and they're still duplicated. But all of the other ones, they only happen once. This, makes your, this has two effects. It makes your node modules folder almost completely flat, uh, which means that there's much less stuff to install. Uh, and it doesn't change how your apps work at all. If you switch from NPM2 to NPM3 and you run NPM install, nothing will change about your app. It will just be slightly smaller. Uh, and the other thing that it does is it helps Windows users who used to run into this problem with really long paths. Uh, Windows Explorer is really bad at paths that are longer than 255 characters for some reason. Uh, and this used, to, this used to drive people on Windows completely crazy because there was no way to delete a node modules folder if it got longer than that. Uh, it also means your node modules folder is smaller, uh, and, and it makes installs faster and downloads faster, and everything in NPM3 is just faster and better in every possible way, and NPM3 is basically made out of magical elf candy, and you should switch to it immediately with one little exception, which is that it's not always faster. Because NPM3 has to calculate your entire tree in advance, it means that it does it when you install for the first time, and that first install is super, super fast. But if you're just installing one extra package, NPM2 would have just done that one extra package and got on with it. But NPM3 is like, hold up, I need to calculate the whole tree again to make sure that this is safe. Uh, which means that, that adding that extra package can suddenly be a lot slower, or maybe only a little bit slower. We're not really sure, uh, because it depends on your app. And there's a ton of apps out there, and we can't, you know, we can't run tests on all of your you know, 2 million users' apps. 
Uh, so it's really important that everybody in this audience start testing NPM3 now so that we can get a sense of exactly how much the performance of NPM3 has changed so that we can start working on tuning performance. NPM3 is going to be out of beta very, very soon. Uh, and the CLI team said that they would kill me if I committed to a date, but it's really, really soon, like soon. So start testing it now because it's going to become the default. And if it becomes the default while it still sucks, then you'll just be angry and it will be your fault. So that's NPM3. Uh, but let's look a little bit further into the future. Uh, see what I did there? Uh, back at the beginning, I told you that the problem NPM3, NPM solves is distribution. All of these features, all of that magic, it's just there to make distributing your code easier. Uh, which is why last year we made a decision, which is that NPM should not be the package manager for Node. Instead, it should try to be a package manager for JavaScript. Uh, True story, NPM never actually stood for Node Package Manager, but it's very hard to convince people of that. Everybody believed it. Uh, why the Package Manager for JavaScript? Uh, well, we always said that we were about reducing friction and getting out of your way. Uh, and it turned out that people were already doing this anyway. People were putting front-end JavaScript into the registry, and they were sort of weirdly embarrassed about it. They were like, oh, we put a whole bunch of CSS into the registry. Is that OK? Are you mad? And we're like, why would we be mad? Like, use our package manager. We, you know, we gave it to you so that you'd put packages in it. Go right ahead. Um, at the beginning of this year, jQuery announced that their plugin registry was going into read-only mode, and that from now on, the NPM registry was where you should publish jQuery plugins. Uh, and as of today, there are about 500 jQuery plugins in NPM, basically all of the ones that were ever in the jQuery official registry. Uh, once you've decided to let in front-end JavaScript into NPM, uh, it's obvious that you can't stop there. CSS and HTML, they come along with JavaScript. It's a thing that you want to do. Uh, so it's useful to be able to bundle them together into packages, which means that as soon as we decided to be the JavaScript package manager, we have to have an even greater ambition, which is that we want NPM to become the way that you build websites in 2015. Ideally, you should write those websites in Node, but you don't have to. We're not, we're not making any demands on that front. We want to be the tool that web developers use to build websites. To be clear, we're not going to be building some gigantic, all-encompassing framework and say, you know, do it this way and only this way. That's not how NPM works. All we want to do is find out the things that are making your life difficult right now as an NPM developer uh, and get out of your way. We've already identified some of the pieces of the front-end puzzle uh, that if you're not familiar with them, you should check them out. Uh, by now, most people have heard of uh, Substack's amazing Browserify. Uh, and we also see a ton of people adopting Webpack. Uh, both of them tackle the problem of getting node modules into your browser so that you can use them there. Uh, but if your package is already able to run in the browser, you don't need to convert it into something that runs in a browser. You can just, uh, if you just want to use npm, install, NPM to install it, like the jQuery plugins, uh, and then you can use a simple script tag to pull it into your app. Uh, then you can just you know, put stuff into a known location and put a script tag and pull in this, pull in this JavaScript that you've NPM installed. Uh, that is how Bower works. And Bower gets an enormous amount of use. Um, but a lot of people have said that it is really annoying to have to use both NPM and Bower. People who use Bower are like, why is the first thing I do with Bower? I NPM install Bower. That seems like NPM should be doing this job. Uh, and we agree. Uh, so we are currently considering adding a new type of dependency to NPM, the browser dependency, uh, which would get installed like Bower does into a single flat directory, everything all in one place. Uh, but this creates a stumbling block, because like I said at the beginning, Node can avoid dependency hell, but browsers can't. If you install two copies of the same uh, Node module and you try and put them in your browser at the same time, they're going to fight with each other, and it's going to be a disaster. Uh, you don't want two copies of jQuery. You don't want two copies of Bootstrap. Uh, the way Bauer handles this is by making you resolve the conflicts yourself. It just tells you to pick one. Uh, and then it remembers which one you picked. Uh, we could do this, and we probably will. Uh, but we're not setting any timeline on when, this, when browser dependencies are going to turn up. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we think Seth Vincent's modular CSS work is absolutely amazing. Uh, the packages that it's using to do that are Sheetify and Parcelify. Uh, and Nicole Sullivan's Dr. Franken style is another really good stab at this problem. As I mentioned earlier, lots of people are getting to ES6. Uh, 
and they want to use those features now before they're available everywhere. Uh, and they use the run scripts to get them into their project lifecycle. Uh, and if you want to hear more about Babel, then you should sit right here because Seth is co Seb is coming on right after me, uh, and that's what he's talking about. Uh, but getting even further into the future, uh, to the point where the team begins to get nervous because they start to promise things that they're not even sure that they can build, uh, we are looking into creating webhooks for NPM. People are familiar with webhooks from GitHub, or some people are. You check something into GitHub, and GitHub makes a call back to your application and it does something, like it runs tests or it deploys something. Uh, we think GitHub's a great place to collaborate on your code, and we think NPM is the best way to distribute it. Webhooks make deployment automation a lot easier, uh, so it's natural that we should add them to our stack. Uh, we'd like you to use NPM to deploy your whole app, uh, and, we'd like to ha and we have plans to make that easier. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we hate Git or GitHub. Quite the contrary. To the, last, the last few months, we've seen us put an enormous amount of effort uh, into improving NPM support for Git repos, uh, resolving tons of long-standing bugs, and that push is going to continue in NPM 3 and NPM 4. Uh, we prefer deploying everything from NPM, but people like using Git repos in NPM. And as ever, we will do our best to get out of your way. We are committed to making sure that, within reason, everything that you can do with an NPM package, you can do with a Git repo if that's what you want to do. So now I'm beginning to get way out of the set of things that we actually have on roadmaps uh, into stuff that we're just sort of talking about, stuff that is sort of wild speculation in the NPM office and makes the team very, very nervous when I go to a conference and mention to other people. Uh, a lot of people have asked if NPM provides any guarantees of package quality or package security. Uh, and the answer is that we don't, because there are 176,000 packages and there are 22 of us. Uh, but it's a really good idea. It would be really good if we could say, this package seems to work well, or this package does not, or this package is dangerous now, you should upgrade. Uh, we could inspect packages for viruses or bad practices or malicious stuff. Uh, we probably wouldn't unpublish them. We, can, you know, we continue to think that anybody should be able to publish anything to the registry, but we'd probably warn end users if that kind of stuff happened. Uh, I can't make any promises about what exactly we're going to do about NPM security, but it is a thing that we are working on. Uh, the security question leads to a more general question, uh, which is how, the, how do we make it easier to tell which of the 176,000 packages are better? Uh, the more packages there are, the harder this problem gets. Uh, we have a lot of data about packages, more than Google does. Uh, but at the moment, people are using Google to find packages, and that's fine. We can do better, and we want your suggestions. Uh, if you can think of a metric that you use that defines for you whether or not a package is good or bad, you should absolutely tell us about it. A lot of people say downloads. A lot of people say GitHub issues. A lot of say people say, how recently was it published? that kind of stuff, but there's tons of edge cases in there, so we really want community feedback. We really want people to tell us how they decide which package is the good one so that we can build that into NPM search. Uh, another thing that new users especially ask for is a way to do stuff outside of the command line. Uh, we think this is important, and we're hiring front-end developers right now to work on it. Uh, we think it should be able to at least start your package or even write your package on the web, especially if it's front-end stuff. You don't need to go to Node if what you're doing is writing CSS. So you should just be able to do the whole thing in NPM on the NPM website. Uh, another idea that gets thrown our way a whole lot is the idea of distributing the registry using BitTorrent uh, or maybe the blockchain. Um, this isn't a crazy idea, but you need to be very careful about what problem you think you're solving when you do that. Uh, if you're trying to solve offline installs, we think using the cache and using uh, that hack that I said, that's a good way of doing that. Uh, if you're trying to solve speed, distributing it is not going to help. If you're trying to solve speed, distributing things makes stuff slower. Uh, and if you're trying to solve redundancy, well, there's like 300 mirrors of the MTM registry right now. I don't know how much more redundant it really needs to be. Uh, so people keep suggesting NPM torrent. We're like, sure, but like, it doesn't really do anything that we need fixed right now. So the future in recap, NPM 3 has a new installer. Everything is deduped. This changes performance, both for good and for bad. NPM is now the package manager for JavaScript and HTML and CSS. Uh, Babel is awesome. Webhooks are coming. Git is a first-class citizen. We're working on security. We're working on package quality. And we're eventually going to be working on a GUI. And bringing it all together, NPM is about distributing software by getting out of your way. 
It does a lot more than you probably know about. It's going to do even more stuff in the future. We're super excited about it. We think it's pretty cool, and we think you should get in on it. Uh, and now, just as I end, I wanted to throw one more thing in there, which has nothing to do with NPM. This is just a personal thing of mine. I started a Slack group uh, for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and other queer people in, who work in tech. If you're in this audience and that is you, then you should join it. And now I'm done. If you asked a question, and uh, you should come and find me for swag. In fact, I have a huge bag full of swag that I'm just dying to give away because it's really heavy. So you should just come and find me and take it away. Thank you very much for listening.